So we talked a little bit about manufacturing uh, in all the sessions today. So we'll make it official with this next panel. Um, so a little bit of backdrop. So I direct at MIT our Master of Engineering and Manufacturing program and also our Medical Electronics and Device Realization Center. And I agree that um, we've certainly moved from, from product to process when it comes to our, our ecosystem uh, environments associated with products. And when we talk about manufacturing uh, anymore, we're talking about design, manufacturing operations, and support. Within the MedRC at MIT, to give you a framework on one of my backgrounds, we look at the intersection of medical devices, tangible devices, big data, uh, microelectronics, um, manufacturing in the big sense, product realization. When people talk about manufacturing as well, we're talking about innovation and where does innovation happen. So one of the questions we'll try to get to on this panel is, is where does innovation happen? And how do you strategically think about investing your limited resources in innovation? And the question that I'll leave just to ponder is if we look at a product life cycle from early stage, fast growth to a mature product, where is product innovation high? Where is it low? And where is process, or what you would classically think of as manufacturing innovation, high or low? Um, this is a, um, a slide looking at the, um, it, presumably, the strategic investment decisions by some big companies. So G Co over here, G is one of these is GE, A is Apple. Um, what this is a slide of is looking at the fraction of manufacturing classified patents to the ratio of all patents for a particular company, these five companies, from 1985 to 2000. So you could potentially draw from here some conclusions about where companies invest their, their limited resources and what are their strategic thoughts about where they think they should be invested in manufacturing, more in the design side, more in the manufacturing, more in the operation side. Thing to note, if you're GE, which is the green dot, you're about 30% throughout history. And if you're Apple, you're down here underneath 5%. The, this is the framework for the questions today, um, but we'll put these slides back up there, but turn it over to the panel to introduce themselves and make some introductory comments. All right. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Michael Dickey. I'm a professor in chemical engineering at NC State, and I'm really fortunate for the keynote talk, which introduced 3D printing, uh, so I don't think I need to introduce it any further. But I uh, just wanted to, to say, uh, talk to you a little bit about my interests as a way of introduction. Um, and maybe a perspective from academics about 3D printing. Um, the way that I look at 3D printing is not so much from a manufacturing perspective, which I think we've already heard that perspective, but as more of an enabler. You know, what can we do with it? And uh, there's been some great work. Um, just for example, I've shown here a picture from Mike McAlpine's group at Princeton in which they've used 3D printing to uh, print biological materials. It's basically sort of like an artificial ear that they printed. Um, for my group, uh, we've been thinking about um, new types of inks that might introduce new functionality. And um, in particular, we're interested in metals. And so we, in the, the previous, the keynote talk, we saw some, um, some metal parts that were printed for uh, basically a turbine for, for GE. And at least as I understand it, the ways these things are made are using high temperature processing. You basically fuse together uh, metal powder. And so we've been thinking about printing uh, liquid metals, but you know, you might be thinking the issue there is, uh, might be mercury, which is toxic. I'm going to show you a quick video, if you don't mind playing the, the video, uh, that illustrates uh, one of the things that we did. So this is a, a, a video in which we are working with a liquid metal. This is all done at, at room temperature. And the key thing here is that this metal forms an oxide skin, which you can see by deflating uh, the metal. And that oxide skin forms spontaneously, and it's extremely thin. It's about a nanometer thick, and it's strong enough to hold together structures. And so what this allows you to do is um, print this metal, which is an alloy of gallium. Uh, it allows you to print it at room temperature. And therefore, you can print 3D structures that are compatible with room temperature processes, compatible with organic materials, biological materials, um, et cetera. And so um, if you're interested, this video is actually on, on YouTube. But one of the other things, in addition to stacking droplets, you can um, extrude wires. And we heard some talk this morning about flexible electronics. Well, you can actually form extremely stretchable and flexible electronics um, using this technology because it is a liquid. So here we do like a little burst of pressure, and we can shoot out a wire. 
and I call this the uh, uh, sort of like a Spider-Man effect where we shoot it out and the oxide forms so fast uh, that it's stable. And so basically we're, been, we're interested in studying these uh, new types of inks. And I think in the interest of time, I'll, I'll pass. Thank you. <clears throat> I'm Walter Johnson. I am uh, the director of the Intelligent Systems Lab at, at PARC, a, a, a small disruptive research center in Palo Alto. Uh, and the lab is basically the AI lab at PARC, and you might ask, what does that have to do with manufacturing? Uh, we do a lot of open innovation work. Uh, a lot of that, I think the concept was uh, framed around PARC. We don't do products. We, we innovate. Uh, one of our partners is standing on the stage with me today. Uh, I want to talk about disruption in supply chains today. A large challenge in, in uh, product design is the ability to develop uh, designs that are manufacturable, uh, that the design is viable. You can create it in a timely fashion uh, at a uh, an acceptable price point. Uh, it's sustainable. It's made with materials that won't harm the user or the world. Uh, right now, this is an incredibly labor-intensive process that requires a lot of iteration. Uh, and so what we've said is that uh, what's needed is a uh, dynamic supply chain, a supply chain that allows you to virtualize itself, the supply chain, before you ever choose what the supply chain is. That means you can pick from the available supply chains and be guaranteed that what you choose will be able to produce your design. It's flexible, configurable, so that you can support multiple variations of the design that you're creating, uh, from customized ones to quantities as small as one, so that individual people can, can take uh, advantage of it. And it's agile, it responds uh, as needed to demand. So the value prop that we're talking about is to uh, more quickly field new products, to secure capacity near to the point of need if necessary, or to distribute it if necessary, and to easily add capacity to handle whatever design's needed. So what are we doing? I'm going to talk about subtractive manufacturing, which isn't nearly as sexy as additive manufacturing, but it's out there today. There's 300,000 small manufacturers in the, in the US that predominantly do that. But a lot of this is very relevant to additive. Uh, we're developing a, developing a set of software tools that allow you to allow a designer to basically instantly in real time determine whether his design or her design is manufacturable by any known uh, machine uh, configurations in the supply chain. Uh, we'll tell them uh, how much it costs, the various ways you can do it, the time it will take. Uh, and to do this requires putting uh, extremely technical knowledge of spatial layout, geometry, uh, all, design expertise and knowledge into the tools at the fingertips of the designer at the time they're designing, so that uh, knowledge of the supply chain is at the fingertips of the designer. Uh, that allows us to uh, generate supply chains in real time, allows designers to, to know what parts in real time of their design should be re redesigned. Uh, and it really, I'll put the democratization word back again, it gives uh, both experts and non-experts uh, access to design knowledge that's, that's now solely in the field of the gurus. Uh, we can also, I'll wrap it up here, we can also augment these models. This is a model-based system with fault models so that you can rapidly find out are there catastrophic situations we'll probably never encounter, but are there. And use the same models <clears throat> to uh, have uh, predictive maintenance so that we can go from schedule-based maintenance to condition-based maintenance uh, with the ultimate goal of self-aware machines that can figure out what's wrong with themselves and uh, uh, ask for help or reconfigure themselves. I'm Beth Pruitt from Stanford Mechanical Engineering. 
Uh, our lab is the Stanford Microsystems Lab, and I just wanted to show you a few concepts that we're working in. We, we actually work primarily in not just manufacturing, but uh, as I say, metrology and MEMS. So a lot of MEMS enabled metrologies for biology. We do a lot of biotechnology measurements, mechanical measurements at the micro scale. But I'd like to echo what many speakers, um, especially Paul this morning, said about this need to be able to integrate across the scales. And so MEMS being a systems field, we worry a lot about going from nano to micro to the macro. And to that end, uh, I wanted to point out a few things. That I think that some of the next big things, and again, as Paul said, it's a little dangerous to predict that, but maybe it's already here, which is this Internet of Things. So we're seeing a lot more distributed sensing, uh, and I believe that maybe this, this idea of distributed computing and having more of a neural network type of behavior is going to eventually mimic this idea of distributed sensing. So our neural system actually is doing a lot on its own, separate from our 10 hertz brain processing that we heard about this morning. So having multiple sensors on one chip and one process gives us a lot more capability and at a reduced cost, potentially. So what I'm showing on that quarter uh, are two generations of sensor fusion chips. The first one was not really uh, driven for power or size and was done in, I guess, both an additive and subtractive traditional MEMS processing. The second one makes use of the second picture down below there, uh, a figure from a paper by Rob Candler and Tom Kenny's group at Stanford. That's an encapsulated MEMS process. You're actually pack packaging the device while you make it at a wafer scale. And this is what is enabling side time to be disruptive to quartz uh, technologies and timing devices made in a CMOS compatible silicon material. So by leveraging that, you almost can't see it, but there is another little device just below the big device in the quarter. And that's the second generation one made using that encapsulated MEM, so almost all the same sensing functions. This is 10 sensing functions in a six mask lithography process. So I think this idea of moving towards sensor fusion and having that be a CMOS compatible low cost process to get sort of good enough sensors for being in the cloud, whether it's in your dishwasher or it's in your iPhone, uh, is going to require a more streamlined design of our, of our manufacturing process to echo, I think, what Max said this morning about being compatible with CMOS. We want to build on the back of, of CMOS compatible, compatibility as much as possible. And then last, I want to talk about a collaboration with uh, some physics groups, so ZX Chen and David Goldhaber Gordon on the bottom. That's an image of just a doped silicon device. And then we see images captured of topography by AFM. We see it's nearly flat. And then there's images captured by scanning microwave microscopy. And so this allows us to image capacitance and resistance to this complex impedance. And we see a lot richer information there about the material properties. That kind of, of in-process test, I think, is going to be what enables us to debug our processes uh, as we start to integrate nano to micro. So before we invest in a fully packaged device to actually be able to do in-line process testing at the nano scale is going to be imperative. And so we're working with them to make new classes of cantilevers that allow us to visualize those types of devices differently. <laughs>